I am Bill Cortright with Living Right with Bill Cortright. And this is the Stress Mastery Podcast, where we take you from the science to the spirituality of stress mastery. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Stress Mastery Podcast. I am your host, Bill Cortright, and I am here with that super millennial, David Barreto. Giving us the millennial perspective. How you doing, Big Dave? I'm doing good. So this week, our topic is collective culture. We kicked it off on Sunday with weekend edition of Stress Mastery with collective culture and Mark Middlestead showing us this last week in his debut episodes. They were excellent. You like them? I... I tell you, I get the sneak peeks, guys, every week. It's really good. It's exciting. And then we're hearing it come out and being able to kind of sit as a student on the weekends instead of editing it. It's awesome. And then Monday, David kicked it off with his episode on Mondays with the Super Millennial on expanding the collective culture. Today's Health Huddles, we're going to talk on health identity. Tomorrow's Meeting of the Minds, we're going to discuss how culture shapes our perception. And on Connection Thursday, we're going to talk on the balanced mind. And on Friday, we will continue our book study, A Happy Pocket Full of Money by David Cameron Giandi. Big Dave. What's going on, man? Not too much, man. I'm ready to rock this thing today. It's a little bit different week. I'm excited about this week because it's a, it's going to be kind of a heavy week topic, I think. Oh, boy. There was the warning, everybody. <laughs> not, not bad, though. I don't think. I think it's a lot of... What people have to understand you. So this week we're talking on collective culture. And today I want to talk about what health identity means. So I believe it actually in my heart, I believe that this week's topic, the collective culture will open your eyes to see how our behavior is dictated by culture. And today we will take health, talk on health and take a look at health. Tomorrow we will discuss how different cultures can take an individual from two different cultures, show them something, and these two individuals will see something entirely different from the other. It's an amazing study. Then on Connection Thursday, we're going to look at how the balance of our minds dictates our behaviors and the world that we see and the environment we build. And all of this that we're talking about this week is tied to collective culture. So this week I will also introduce to you a tribe in Brazil called the Pidaha. And this is what I'm studying right now a lot of. They are one of the last gather and hunter groups still in existence today. And I'm studying this tribe to better, better understand the human being. For this tribe lives their life like our ancestor did for 200,000 plus years. And then it's only been over the last 10,000 years that the human being has advanced their mind and intelligence. Yet, by studying this tribe, we can still see how the human being has the same operating system and survival processes today as we did 200,000 years ago. While our mind has expanded, the body functions the same. And by studying the Pidaha tribe, we can see our true nature as human beings. They are truly a happy people. And I'll get more into that on Thursday. The biggest aspect that I'll say in observing the Pitaha is how their collective culture operates. They live life with an emphasis on the group and the needs of the group as a whole over the needs and the desires of the individual. In their collective culture, relationships with other members of the tribe and the interconnectedness between each member is actually what plays a central role in each person's identity. It's something I, it, it's amazing to watch. Yeah, it's almost, it, it's watching like our history in real time, right? And, and we can learn so much. The Pidiha operates perfectly as the Homo sapien, which is modern man and us, is designed to operate and function. Mm-hmm. They have programmed rituals, rules, and roles that are automatically passed to the children through the stages of development. And they their human construct operates just like ours, scanning the environment for anything that does not belong. And this signal of danger, if this should happen, the alarm system activates. They go into fight or flight. 
and event judgment reaction is their state. Now, this only activates though if there is a danger. The PDH primarily, primarily live in the green zone in the recuperation system in event awareness response. And what this does, this state creates a focus and natural mindfulness. They literally live in flow. This is how they're able to fish with a bow and arrow. <laughs> Don't know how they do that. And they deal with snakes, spiders, and Amazon challenges, of course. But it's also the reason that they are a very happy people. Mm -hmm. So I'll get deeper into that this week because we're talking on culture. But today, let's have a discussion on health identity. You have anything you want to add before we start? I always thought that was very uh, interesting on the way that, you know, these what people would call primitive tribes, how they are. But it, it goes to show you how much advancements I'm going to share what kind of hinder us. I am going to share what your mom said because your mom always watches what I'm studying. Oh, right? God, yeah. I'll share. I'll share that on Thursday, though. <laughs> All right. So. So we, we're talking on health identity. Identity, and this is an important episode because identity is defined as the fact of being who or what a person is. Now, your health identity is comprised of your beliefs about health, your beliefs about medicine, your beliefs about diet and exercise. The health identity is comprised of your beliefs about aging, disease, and your body as a whole. Now, our health identity is what determines our health. This is the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And this is not what you're going to hear a lot out there. So if we look at what we're talking about, the human being is hardwired for behavior. This behavior is dictated by what is held in mind. Your health identity is constructed of programs that create the belief systems that will drive your behavior of diet, exercise, self-care, wellness, and attitude. Now, we all understand the body supports the mind. So let's say, David, your health identity is you're a vegan diet, regular exercise, you're big into yoga. This identity doesn't eat junk food. This identity abstains from alcohol. This health identity will have skills, habits of eating well and training their body. The question Will this person be healthy? Ooh. Well, yeah, it depends. And it, it depends a lot. And I know you asked these freaking trick questions. You actually answered it. The <laughs> answer depends on their state of consciousness. You know, everybody feels for me when you do this, I right? I know. <laughs> because the answer really does depend on their state of consciousness that they predominantly exist in. This person with healthy behaviors and skills will benefit little if they are a negative person stuck in judgment and reaction. If they're consistently have their nervous system stuck in the alarm system red zone, and if their nervous system is in a red zone, the body has to support the mind. So the body's in the red zone, which means every cell is in reaction. And when every cell's in reaction, when we are stuck in stress, the processes of stasis are shut down, disrupting hormonal imbalance. The metabolism of the body shuts down. The body becomes catabolic, breaking down. And all of this increases disease and inflammation. The body supports the mind. So our state of mind is as important to our health identity as the foods we consume and the exercise that we do. So you're right. It depends. You got it. No trick question. No trick question. <laughs> yeah, so, this was one thing that I'll, I'll put in a little quick note for, on, on there because that was the first time it really clicked. Uh, when my stepmom, she had uh, cancer and they told her that your mindset is more important than what you put in your body. And I thought that was stupid because I was like, well, no, what the medicine, the food, that's so important. The doctor was focused in on where your very mindset good is at. Yeah, and to me, and that goes to show how a lot of people listening will be like, that's stupid, Bill. No. Now I, my mind has completely switched. And that's what we're going to talk about today because if you don't switch your mind, you're not going to change your body. Because mm -hmm. you got to understand, every minute of every day, your body is physically reacting and literally changing the response to the thoughts that run through your mind. Your state of mind is part 
a crucial part of your health identity. Your personal development practices are as important for your health as exercise is. Just thinking about something causes your brain to release neurotransmitters, chemical messengers that allows communications with our nervous system, red zone, green zone, and these neurotransmitters control virtually all of your body's functions from hormones to digestion to how you feel, whether you feel happy, sad, or whether you're stressed out. So how powerful is our mind when it comes to the body? There are studies that have shown that our thoughts alone can improve vision, fitness, and strength. So I have shared this story before, but I want to share it again for this episode. In 1985, I had an accident that would land me in the hospital for three months and in a body cast for four months. And the end result would be I would have my spine, my lower spine would be fused together. By 1985, I had been a bodybuilding now for four years and already won my first contest. And I was told flat out by the medical professionals, I would never compete again and never be able to lift weights heavier. And I think it was 10 to 15 pounds. I remember it was something ridiculous like that. <laughs> now, my mentor, Dan, the California bodybuilder who taught me everything about training, nutrition, supplementation, and the sport of bodybuilding was what you would call a rather strange individual. He was a loner. He was, he was very spiritual. He was a student of philosophy and stoicism. And he believed in meditation and visualization was as much as important as much as diet and exercise. Just as important. Now, with him, every single workout began with reading some stoic writings, usually Seneca. We would discuss what we read. And then we would visualize the entire planned workout. And then we would meditate. He had me meditate to a mantra called So Hum. This took about 30 minutes. And not a single workout would begin before we did this routine. So this is how I had been programmed to take care of my, my body. Right? He had programmed me into mine. So while laying in that hospital bed... Everyone felt bad for me, yet I could never let go of what Dan would tell me. He always told me everything happens in the mind before it transforms into the body. So I made a decision. First decision was I was going to completely recover from this. And the second decision was I was going to compete again. So I decided I was going to keep working out. And I began to do my workouts in the hospital bed. If it was Monday, it meant it was chest day. I would do some reading, just like I always would. I would go through my mind on what the workout was going to be, and then I would meditate. And after that, I would go through the exact workout in my mind as if I was in the gym, to the point of even putting the plates on the bar. I would slow way down. Now, I would go through the lift in my mind, each rep, feeling the muscle as if I was doing the exercise physically. And I began doing this mainly at night because then the ward would be dark and nobody would bother me. <laughs> Nothing worse than being in the middle of a, a rep and I have somebody to take my temperature. <laughs> so I realized I got to do it while everybody, while, while everybody slept, I worked out. And so, Hey, that's still how it goes now. <laughs> yeah, Nothing's changed, right? So when I got out of the hospital... I went home and my training partner, um, Terry, he connect, reconnected with me. We had been separated for a while. He began helping me to the gym. And I trained in a body cast. And I did what I could do, which was upper body. This cast covered me from my torso, ran down to my hips, and down my entire left leg. So... I couldn't train legs, so what I do for legs was what I exactly what I did in the hospital. So what happened? Well, I had a choice. I could have accepted the health identity the doctors gave me, which was, you have a really bad back. And I could have lived with a bad back, not lifting anything or doing anything that would hurt me because can't do that 
All the limitations when you think you have something bad, can't lift up, can't bend over, can't step up, can't do this because I have a bad back. This is what a health identity does. It drives your behavior. Or I could put to test what Dan had taught me about the mind. And the results were I would go on to actually win the 1986 Intercontinental Bodybuilding Championships. And the results are still at age 60. I'm still active, strong, and I'm planning on to compete again. If I had not had Dan as a mentor, and I'll be honest with you, David, if Dan, because he was whacked, he was weird. <laughs> and I didn't say I liked everything he was doing to me either, because I, I just wanted to work out. I didn't care about all that stuff. But man, if I didn't have Dan for a mentor, I'm not sure none of this happens, what happened. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I would say, because a lot of people listening, they, they, most of these people think you're a robot. Yeah, I thought so I'm too. Not. Yeah, but that's the thing. I get to see it on a day to day basis to watch how those, the way that you trained from this story to how training with you, because we sat down. I remember, and it's part of my workout now. I go in the gym, I sit down 10, 15 minutes by myself. And it's something that I picked up from seeing you do. Before I knew that story, I was like, why are we doing this? Like, we're wasting time, man. It's 3 30 in the morning. Let's get it going. But as I continue to go, and especially when I fail on a, a rep or I fail on a certain thing, doing that has helped me not beat myself up. It's helped the process continue. And it also allows me to add that into the, the mix of my progression. So seeing that, you know, and how that follows, that identity of being able to do all that 30 years plus now is, is crazy. It's, I'm just saying, you know, because what happens is, Back then, they didn't know a lot about the mind the way they do today. Mm -hmm. Today, the power of the mind is widely known. Think about this. We did a show on the placebo effect, remember? Yeah. And we were talking about fake operations. Where the guy <laughs> didn't even do an operation and the person's knee was better, right? That At, pissed right? me off. <laughs> right? We talk, you can see where these sham drugs heal people and all they are sugar pills. And this works because the power of thought. Back with Dan, few people were ever tied the body to the mind. Now, your body identity is what you believe about your body's capabilities and limitations. Your body identity is how you perceive your body and how you perceive your body produces thoughts and visions in your mind. And this creates your story of health. Now, how many of you listening have had other people write your story of who you are. Well, I can bet you if you slow down, you will see how they wrote the story of your body identity too. Because your body identity for the most part was programmed by the age of seven at the end of stage one of development, impulsive mind. But as you go through experiences and this happened and a doctor tells you this, well, I am diabetic. I am, I have a slow metabolism. I am this. I have a bad back. I can't do this. Why? Because you were told you couldn't and you accepted it and it became part of your body identity. And your beliefs about health, doctor, exercise, foods are set. I have a slow metabolism. Guess what? Yes, you do. I don't have willpower. Guess what? You're right. My family has bad genetics. Well, you must have bad genetics too. I'm lazy. So you say. I'm not disciplined. Nope, you're not. I don't have time. Man, you must be busy. <laughs> you know, I, really, there's nobody can argue with you because mm -hmm. you're creating your identity. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think people even take that to a, a bigger extreme. You know, like uh, like when when I hurt my back, no working out. You have to recover. I sat down all day. Then I didn't even walk. I didn't even do that. I took that to the busy. That's what extreme. they teach you. Yeah, and that's that's yeah. I think that's so many people. I have diabetes. Okay, so and then you take it to the furthest extreme possible. I have this. I have this, and then you limit yourself so far beyond, and then you just label it as a fail safe of I have this. And when that happens, when you accept the diagnosis, you have now added that to your health identity, mm -hmm. and so these beliefs about health, and as I mentioned earlier, all thoughts, beliefs affect every cell in the body and the body supports the mind 
So the bottom line is this. Your thoughts activate your genes. Slow down and just take a breath and comprehend what I'm about to tell you. You are speaking to your genes with every thought you have. The field of epigenetics, we talk about it a lot on this show, is showing that who you are is the product of the things that happen to you in your life. Your vibration, right? We build our reality through our vibration, which changes the way your genes operate. Genes are actually switched on and off depending on your life experience. We say our new program is about transformation of, bo of body, mind. Well, the biggest part of that transformation is life experience because your genes are reacting to your life experience. Your genes and lifestyle form a feedback loop. You don't alter the genes you were born with, people. What changes is your gene activity. Hundreds of proteins, enzymes, and other chemicals that regulate your cells are tied to your identity base and state of being every given moment. If you're an event, judgment, and reaction, this sets your perception into the negative red zone, and this controls your biology and genes to express disease. But if you're mindful, you let go, you see the ego, you slow down and go into event awareness and response, this sets your state in mindfulness. And this expresses in your biology as health and well-being. In fact, only 5% of gene mutation are thought to be direct cause of health issues. 5%. This leaves 95% of the genes that can act as influencers of health or they can act as influencers of disease. Either way, it's according to you and your health identity. Mm -hmm. It's a big thing when you start to really understand this. Because we're so programmed that diet and exercise, diet and exercise. And it's important, but it can't overrule your state of being and what you hold in mind. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. I've seen myself limit my, my, my own self, you know, starting, especially like the high school time where you're just trying to like figure out who you are and then you listen to what people say. Same thing, the coaches, all those people used to tell me, this is how you're built, follow this. Yeah. And I thought that was great advice at the time because you look at someone else and you're like, well, you don't look the same. Well, you don't look the same. And I always blame bad genetics. Well, I didn't blame the food I was eating, the sweet tea I was drinking, the not working out. I never blame that. But it's interesting when you say that because – when I look at my, my physique and competition shape, Mark Middlestead will tell you, if you were to look at me when we were when we were together, there's no way I could have a 28-inch waist and compete the way I competed. It yeah. would be genetically impossible. At least that's what you would say when I was obese. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what it is until you peel it away. And we all have the choice to set our health identity. And to do this properly, this really set your health identity properly, you must set body, mind, and life experience. So let's talk about this a little bit. Health identity. What is the first thing to create a change? And David talks about it all the time. The first thing that happens to create a change is awareness. So if you want to change your health identity, you have to be aware of what your health identity is now. Mm -hmm. And you have to be very honest with yourself. You have to really explore what are your limiting beliefs. And it's very important. All change begins with awareness. And these beliefs, these limiting beliefs, are currently driving your behavior. I'm lazy. I'm too old. I don't have willpower. I'll be selfish if I go work out. I can't lose weight. Whatever it is. All of that has driving your behavior. But you have to know and see what they are. You need them out, right? Also, notice if you complain about something. You complain about, oh, I'm so tired. That's a, that, is, that is, by the way, a health identity. Mm -hmm. The moment you say you're tired, every cell in your body becomes tired. You guys, 
Those words aren't innocent. They're powerful. The word is powerful. So if you're complaining about something, in fact, if you're exercising and complaining about exercising while you're exercising, you basically cancel the effects of the exercise. Just go home. But you actually canceled it. <laughs> Think about it. What we just talked about today. And you people can argue with me all they want. Just research it if you don't believe me. So that's the first thing I think. What do you think? That's the first thing I think is that they got to figure out where they are now. Yeah, I think awareness. Find your find the conflict. Yes. I think that's the biggest where thing. Where is it? What is it? And be honest with yourself. Ask somebody. Because mm -hmm. you might not even know. Yeah. Ask the person closest to you. What do I complain about? Mm -hmm. And they'll tell you. <laughs> right? Yeah. They'll tell you. <laughs> so number two, once you do that, I think it's so important. We got to, we want to really do this right. Number two. You have to ask yourself the question is, what do you want? Mm -hmm. What do you want your health identity to look like? And describe it in detail. How do you want to feel? How do you want to move? How do you want to wake up? How do you want your energy throughout the day? How do you want to look? Look is the last thing, by the way. Yeah. I don't give a crap what somebody looks like. Mm -hmm. I really don't. It's really all about how you feel. Right? Nothing, man. You could be you could be the, the perfect body. And if you feel like crap, what a waste of time. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know, so will you agree with me? Yeah, what do you I don't want? Next, much to next? add on that. At okay. All, yeah. So we, we we're looking at limiting beliefs. We're looking at what is the other day. Now, if you have those things going, you'll have awareness. You now have your awareness. You know what your conflict is, and you have awareness of where you want to go. Right? So next is going to be about developing practices and techniques so this is where diet and exercise green focus power hour comes in so your next thing is you want to understand and discover how your body works you want to start the proper diet but believe it or not you don't have to start a diet if you want to get your health identity in place first just eat in a window i just did it with a client it's been a magnificent transformation in less than 30 days right Control the diet, movement. You got to move, right? So discover exercise. If you've never exercised, get a trainer. Invest in you. This is the difference between spending and investing. It's invest, learn how to work out. And listen, if you can't afford a trainer, I bet you there's a YouTube out there that'll show you how to do it because we have so much content now that you can go to and learn. But you got to move it. Drink water. Oh my gosh, people, drink water. I, I can't, I'm not even going to talk anymore about water. Drink Cheers. water. <laughs> sleep. You want to start? Really get, get your sleep going. And what I mean by that is set a time when you're going to bed and shut down and go to bed. Really discipline yourself and set the time you're going to get up and get up. Do not hit snooze. And it, that's how it all starts because you have the awareness. Now you got to start the practices. And, uh, and yes, you need to start your personal development. So if somebody was asking me, what would you do, Bill? Well, if I had, wasn't doing anything and I was going to do this, once I had my awareness, first thing I would do is I would eat in a window of 12 to 6. I would start going for a little walk or moving during the day. I would start the Green Focus Power Hour. That's how I would start. I would be drinking my water. I would be really focused on the water. And I would start closing and studying my day into sleep. That's how I would start. And then I would get education and get accountability and I would be expanding this plan. Because the idea is when you create a health identity, you want it to be like this. You did your awareness. You then developed your techniques and practices, but you want those practices to become skills. And this is what creates a shift when you don't have to think about your diet and exercise or think about your water because they become habits. Mm -hmm. That's creating a health identity. 95% of your behavior is driven by the subconscious mind of the cage mind. So whatever's programmed in there is automatic behavior. So yes, you got to go through the testing periods of change, but you have to go through these change. That's why having a coach, having a trainer, having accountability, having a friend, whoever it is that keeps you moving because I guarantee you along, you'll fall down, but you got to get right back up. That is the most important thing because if you stay down, well, then you're going to have, you're all the way back in the beginning. David. 
Yeah, I, I think um, we, we tend to overcomplicate things um, all the time. I don't know why, what it is. We just like overthinking, especially, you know, for all the people who are just starting. The two things that I, I have um, that I think people um, kind of feel like they have to go all in or nothing is the movement part. I think that's one of the biggest ones. I talked about the car accident that I got into um, 2012. Um, you were there. I was on the way to the gym. Mm -hmm. I couldn't work out for, for months. But the first few weeks, my dad used to take me to the gym. And he was like, what, would, what workout would you do? So I was like, oh, I'll do, you know, shoulder press. So I would go and sit down. Go pretend like you're going to grab weights. And I would sit down and do all these things. For that, I sped up the process of healing so much because I was getting up, sitting down, getting up. It's your mind. They told me not to move, not to yeah. lift weights. Yeah. And my dad was like, no, just go and move and do things like that. So movement like that. And people were like, well, you went to the gym and did nothing. No, I could have sat home and really did nothing. I think that's the big thing. Go walk outside. You have stairs, walk up your stairs. So little things like that. And then the water thing changed everything for me. It changes the game. Bill, Bill used to make fun of me on every episode. Where's your water, Dave? Where's your... You will not see me without this anymore. Yeah, because... It's I just, travel with it and everything. Because it, there, you're right. It doesn't have to be complicated. And the most important thing is, is really understanding that your thoughts matter. Mm -hmm. That's why learning stress mastery, naming your ego, learning to let go technique. And one of the most powerful things is the slow down method. Every time you slow down, you literally switch your cells over to wellness mm -hmm. every time. If that became a habit where you were to actually slow down for as little as 30 seconds to a minute every hour, your health would expand because you're shutting off the red zone and you're turning on the wellness of the cells. Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't as hard as people think, yeah. but it's really, if you're stuck in your story, if you're stuck in perceptional blindness and deaf effect and you're stuck in the red zone, yeah, it's hard because you'd say it's hard. Yeah, especially that deaf effect because everybody knows the conflict. Everybody knows what they, I have mm -hmm. my, my knees hurt, my back hurts, I'm overweight, my high blood mm -hmm. pressure, this, what's the resolution? And nobody does that. And that's why you overthink and you think about all these things that are wrong, but you haven't figured out the resolution. When you do, then you can just put it in baby steps there. Take movement, start drinking, go to sleep, do these yep. things. Doesn't mean you have to go full bodybuilder mode or fact, power you, lifter. In, you fact, you <laughs> in fact, yeah. you should never do that. You should never try to go full out because the body can't handle it. Mm -hmm. You're just stressing your body out. Yeah. It's these little increments. I think the awareness is so important. You mm -hmm. can't change anything if you don't see yeah. the conflict, mm -hmm. right? The awareness. That's it for today's show. Our mission here is to create a shift in the planet. You can join us on this mission by simply like, share, and subscribe. Links are right below the show. As always, until next time, stay inspired. inspired.